Yeah, yeah, no one's going to talk to him.
Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Take your time whenever you want. Yeah, people are simple. Then when he, he didn't tell us until he got there, and then he wants all the people and he said, no, 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 no,
to speak about this. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Hey, hi. Hello. Hello. I can make my voice really low, <clears throat> but I won't. Um, hi, my name is uh, Melissa Franklin, and I teach physics here. Um, and I have a, uh, we have a science book talk series, and it's the, includes the Harvard Bookstore. <laughs> and the Harvard Division of Science. <laughs> uh, and the Harvard Library. Yay! Okay. And uh, we have talks um, every couple of weeks, which you can find out about uh, in the Harvard Bookstore website. Uh, and then we record these talks, and so you can see them and show them to your friends uh, on YouTube. Um, and so it's, it's very much fun, and I'm very happy that you chose to come here tonight. Um, and anyhow, I'm very happy because I, uh, my colleague Avi Loeb, who I've known since I was younger than I am now, <laughs> uh, is an exciting speaker, uh, and um, he's written this interesting book, Interstellar. Um, so I'm very, very pleased to introduce him. I just want to say before that that there is. Uh, Later this month, there's going to be another book talk, but online by Camilla Nord. Um, and she, she, her book is The Balanced Brain, uh, The Science of Mental Health. So after this talk, if you think you need to know more about uh, the science of mental health, then you could come on February 19th. Not come, you could uh, go through the bookstore to listen. Um, so what's going to happen tonight is that it's uh, Avi's going to give a t uh, Professor Loeb is going to give a talk <laughs> for 45 minutes, and then you're going to have a chance to ask questions. Uh, see if you can make the questions um, the most lucid questions in the world under a minute, <laughs> if possible, just because lots of people will probably want to answer questions. So Avi uh, is a professor. Uh, he's the Frank Baird Jr. It doesn't mean he's a junior professor, by the way. It just, <laughs> just means that Frank Baird was a junior um, of science at Harvard. Uh, he's been chair of the astronomy department. He was uh, the first uh, chair of the uh, Black Hole Institute. Um, he uh, is the current director of the Institute for Theory and Computation in the Center for Astrophysics at the Harvard Smithsonian. Uh, he also leads the Galileo Project uh, and he chairs the advisory committee for the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative. Very exciting. Um, and he's a guy who um, apparently uh, thinks mostly in the shower. Uh, so there's a lot of showering going on. And, um, and, has, and because you shower every day, it means that he's written a thousand papers. Um, <laughs> That was supposed to be funny. Was that okay? Yeah. yeah okay. Um, but he's just a very, very prolific uh, uh, scientist uh, who's worked on many things. The last time he was here, he gave a talk on exoplanets and how we can uh, identify them. Apparently, he was uh, very involved in the idea of looking for the first stars, if there were first stars, 6,000 years ago, right? <laughs> and um, sorry, that wasn't that funny. Sorry. I take that back. Can you cut that part out? <laughs> okay. Anyhow, he's just an amazing guy. and You don't want to listen to me. You want to listen to him. But I do want to tell you that after the talk and after the questions, there are the cheese cubes. And the cheese cubes are, uh, if you go out, this, out of here and you go across the, the hallway into the, the Cabot Library, uh, Avi will be signing books. If you have a book and you want it signed to someone in particular, um, I think, and, uh, and the cheese cubes. Uh, so please welcome Avi Loeb. Thank you so much, uh, Melissa. We could have saved some time if you introduced me as a farm boy. I'm just a curious farm boy. I was born on a farm, collected eggs every afternoon, and developed 
affinity or connection to nature much more than to people. And that's very beneficial because I don't have any footprint on social media. And uh, it saves me time. It saves me agony. Uh, and um, it allows me to connect with my true love, which is nature. I jog every morning at sunrise, surrounded by birds, ducks, whatever there is out there. And also, when observing the universe, I really feel that it's the deepest connection you can have because most of the, re of the real estate is actually beyond the Earth. We focus on what happens on this planet, this rock that was left over from the formation process of the sun. Uh, but it's just a tiny rock. And not only we focus on what happens on this planet, we also fight over territories. There are two wars right now over pieces of land on this rock, and people kill each other for that. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. And we spend $2 trillion a year on military budgets worldwide. I calculated that if we were to spend it on sending probes to interstellar space, we could send a probe towards every star in the Milky Way galaxy within a century. It's just a question of priorities. So then you ask, how would we change the priorities? Obviously, I'm not as naive as John Lennon, who said, imagine all the people living in peace. That, that's great to imagine. Even though I'm a theorist, I would say that's very unlikely to happen by itself. Uh, the way to change our priorities is to find a letter in our mailbox from someone else who is doing better, who is a role model, who is a better student in the class of intelligent civilizations. And my way of thinking of it, since uh, Melissa brought up uh, the Jewish perspective of 6,000 years, um, one thing that is mentioned in the Jewish religion, but also in Christianity, is the fact that we, we will have a visit from the Messiah in the future. That's when peace will come to earth. And in difference from many Orthodox Jews, I don't think the Messiah will arrive from Brooklyn, New York. <laughs> I think the Messiah will arrive from an exoplanet. And once we meet a superhuman entity, a civilization, that is far more advanced than we are, we will feel religious awe. Just the way Moses felt when he witnessed the burning bush that was never consumed. And today, you can buy on Amazon a burning bush that doesn't get consumed. <laughs> uh, it only illustrates the fact that an advanced technology is a good approximation to God. Because Moses believed in God as a result of seeing this burning bush. And if you were to take a cave dweller, a prehistoric cave dweller, to New York City right now, everything would look like a miracle. And that's the way we would feel in front of the products of a civilization that had more than one century of science and technology. Because quantum mechanics was discovered just a century ago. And all of the gadgets that you see in this room are based on our understanding over one century. So just think what will happen in a thousand years, a million years, a billion years, and most stars form billions of years before the sun. But I don't need to say much more because today, this morning, I received an email. Have a look at the new ad advertisement that Martin Scorsese directed for the Super Bowl on Sunday. So I'm giving you a preview of one of the ads <laughs> that will appear on Sunday in the Super Bowl. I thought it's very fitting to, for me to start with that. Um, so let me show it to you. It's just one minute. Reports of flying saucers are nothing new. These are routine sightings, not isolated events. Are you seeing that? It's spinning. There's a whole swarm of them. Oh my God. They're all against the wind. All against the wind. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
to take Broadway. This always happens. Okay, that's the ad. And now let me start with my presentation. Oops, what is going on? Oh, that's... Okay, we're done with that. Okay, so I'm here to talk about... Uh, the title of my book, Interstellar, which means in between the stars. And um, I was actually invited in a week to uh, give a keynote uh, lecture uh, in Poland. I was invited by the government of Poland. They celebrate 550 years uh, since the birth of Nicolaus Copernicus, who realized that we are not at the physical center of the universe. And you might say, why is that sh so shocking? Well, it was shocking because people prefer to believe that we are important, that we are at the center. Everything goes around us. If you look at the sky, things move around, and it's around us. And uh, I sort of understood why it was natural to very wise people like Aristotle and a thousand years after I told to almost everyone, including the church, when my daughters were very young uh, and they were at home, they thought the world centers on them because they got all the attention and all their experience was limited to their immediate vicinity. But obviously, when on the first day in the kindergarten, they had a psychological shock. And that's what I'm talking about. In order for us to mature, we need, we need to admit that there could be others and search for them. And when Enrico Fermi said, where is everybody? Uh, 73 years ago, having lunch in Los Alamos. That's a very arrogant question because why would you expect them to come next to you in Los Alamos at the time that you're having lunch. Like, time is measured in billions of years in cosmic history. And space is vast, tens of thousands of light years between the stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone. And 13.8 billion years, billion light years, if you go all the way to the edge of the observable universe. So, we are not really important. And just keep in mind that if we are visited, they didn't have us in mind. Many people say, oh, if they come here, they must worry about us. They must be interested in us. Forget about it. Because we existed as the human species only for a few million years. And they embarked on the journey most likely billions of years ago. Because most stars formed billions of years before the sun. And if you ask, how long does it take to travel? Well, even if you just use the rockets that we produce right now, we send five of them to interstellar space. Voyager 1, Voyager 2, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, New Horizons. They move at around several tens of kilometers per second. They would traverse the Milky Way galaxy from one side to the other side in less than a billion years. And that means that such rockets could have reached us by now, given the age difference 
between the sun and most stars. Most stars formed billions of years before the sun. So we are late to the party. And when you read the morning news, if you are frustrated by what's going on, just keep in mind that there could be a party going on down the street, down the cosmic street. That's a good way to uplift your spirit, to change your priorities. So what I will be speaking in Poland in a week is the next Copernican revolution. That is the title of my talk. Now what you see in this image, and this is a real image, is of the Tesla Roadster that Elon Musk owned and put as a dummy payload on the heavy Falcon four years ago. They needed something heavy. He said, take my car. <laughs> they put it there, launched it into an elliptic orbit around the sun. It's going beyond Mars. We cannot see it with our telescopes. But if we did, I'm sure that some astronomers who are not aware of the fact that it's a car would say it's a rock of a type that we've never seen before, <laughs> but it's a rock. <laughs> maybe a hydrogen iceberg, maybe a nitrogen iceberg, maybe a dust bunny, <laughs> something. And my point is that Elon Musk is not the most accomplished entrepreneur who existed since the Big Bang. OK, despite of what he might tell you. <laughs> there are hundreds of billions of stars like the sun in the Milky Way galaxy alone. There are trillions of galaxies in the observable volume of the universe. It just doesn't make sense that Elon Musk is the most accomplished. <laughs> and therefore, there should be many cars floating out there. We should just check whether among the rocks in our backyard, which we are used to, all these asteroids, comets, maybe, maybe there is a tennis ball thrown by a neighbor. Why is that so difficult to imagine? It's not to me, but for, to my colleagues, it's very difficult. Uh, and I'll talk about that. Now, Elon Musk actually a month ago gave a speech about uh, uh, 2024 Starship and said, you know, I look around, I don't see any aliens, and therefore it's very possible that we are alone, therefore we have responsibility to become a multi-planet species. And therefore, uh, we want to go to Mars so that a single point catastrophe here on Earth will not eliminate humanity. And I say, well, in order to get new knowledge in science, you need to put some work. You know, we invested $10 billion in the Large Hadron Collider to find the Higgs boson. We invested $10 billion in the Webb Telescope to find the first generation of, of galaxies in the universe. We invested a billion dollars in the LIGO experiment to find gravitational waves. If people would say, I don't see any Higgs boson around me, I don't see any uh, high redshift early galaxy around me, you know, I don't see gravitational waves, maybe they don't exist. That's not the way science is done. Knowledge, new knowledge does not fall into your lap. When people say extraordinary, Claims require extraordinary evidence. Most of them are not seeking the evidence. It's a circular argument, and they justify doing nothing by saying that. And I say extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. <laughs> and I say that to Elon Musk. Now, the one special thing about the last decade 
Maybe some of you did not notice it, but it was the first decade in human history where objects from outside the solar system were discovered. And the first one that made the news was found by a telescope in Hawaii called PanStars that was constructed as a result of a task that uh, the US Congress gave to NASA in 2005 to find 90% of all objects bigger than a football field that come close to Earth. They are called near-Earth objects. And the reason is simple. We know that the dinosaurs were not very smart. How do we know that? Well, because a rock the size of Manhattan Island killed all of them. And they didn't develop telescopes to protect themselves from these rocks coming from the sky. In fact, humans, if you go back more than two centuries ago, people did not believe that rock can fall from the sky. That doesn't make sense. Rocks are on the ground. Why would? And then uh, there was a famous, uh, in 1803, a famous uh, uh, meteor fall uh, in France that convinced people that rocks fall from the sky. The most recent event was actually over Berlin on January 21st this year. And uh, I just posted this morning on medium.com an essay. You can read every day or two essays that I post on medium.com. Just put my name. And what happened with this uh, one over Berlin, it was just um, a rock that is roughly a meter in size that exploded as a result of its friction with air. That's called the meteor. And then they found pieces of it perpendicular to the path of the meteor, the fireball that was created. And you may ask, how is that possible that they went sideways along a line? Well, just check my essay. It's basically the friction with air that made all of these fragments move together with the wind across the region 10 kilometers in size. And physics works. That's the amazing thing. When I woke up at 4.30 AM this morning, I had half an hour before my morning jog. I went through the equations. And all of the data on this meteor that exploded over Berlin fits physics the way we know it. You can explain all these details. So it's beautiful. You know, you see something. You don't know how it happens. You work out the equations at 4.30 AM, half an hour, everything agrees. You go on a morning jog. That's the beauty of being a scientist. Uh, so this is Oumuamua, the first object that was reported uh, to be close to Earth. It was flagged as a near-Earth object by this telescope in Hawaii uh, on October 19, 2017. And uh, after they flagged it as a near-Earth object, they measured its speed. And it turns out it was moving too fast to be bound to the sun. So they said, here is an interstellar object, an object that came from the solar system, moving too fast to be bound by gravity to the sun. And uh, to me, that was surprising, because a decade earlier, I wrote, uh, I co-authored the first paper that forecasted how many such rocks should exist based on what we know about the solar system. And we predicted none would be observed by the PanStars telescope. And when you get something wrong, it's not a blow to your ego. In science, if you get something wrong and the experiment proves something else being right, it's an opportunity to learn something because it means that nature is educating you. And that's a great thing. You know, I always want to figure out something that I don't know. Because what's the point if it agrees with what you expected? There is nothing new that you learn. And so I was intrigued by this. And then the data came in, and this object looked weirder and weirder. Uh, it was tumbling every eight hours, and the amount of sunlight reflected from it changed by a factor of 10 as it was tumbling. And based on the reflection of sunlight, its shape was most likely flat. So just think about a piece of paper tumbling in the wind. It's very unlikely that the piece of paper will be edge-on to your line of sight. 
And variations by a factor of 10 in the area projected in front of you means that we are talking about an extreme geometry. We don't see factors of change variations for other asteroids in the solar system. And then this object was showing a push away from the sun by a mysterious force. And I say mysterious because usually you have the rocket effect that you can get from cometary evaporation. When a comet loses mass, it's sort of like a rocket. It, the, the evaporation takes material in one direction and then just like a jet engine, it pushes the object in the opposite direction. But there was no evaporation around this object Oumuamua. And it was given the name Oumuamua because it means a scout in the Hawaiian language, the first. So what is pushing it? And I said, well, the only other thing I can think of is the sunlight reflected off it. But for that, the object had to be very thin, sort of like a sail or a surface layer of a bigger object that was torn apart or broke off. But nature doesn't make thin objects. So I said, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's uh, artificial in origin. And this paper, where I suggested it with, with a postdoc of mine, was accepted for publication within three days. And the referee actually said, this is a great idea. In fact, we know this object was very likely flat. So it could have been a light sail. And then the media started paying attention. And I was on my way to a conference in uh, uh, Berlin. And um, as I was leaving <laughs> my home, uh, there, were, there was a television crew from uh, Boston. And I said, sorry, I have to leave. And they said, well, just one question. Are we alone? <laughs> and, and when I arrived at Berlin, there were like um, maybe 30 emails uh, stacked up. And there was a lot of media attention. And that, of course, started bringing haters as well. So this opened up a new frontier. But it was not actually the first interstellar object that humans discovered because exactly 10 years ago, on January 8, 2014, the US government satellites spotted a meteor over the Pacific Ocean, about um, 85 uh, kilometers away from uh, Manus Island in Papua New Guinea. And they measured the, the velocity of it. And for five years, nobody paid attention. As part of the interest in what I did about Oumuamua, I was interviewed on the radio one day, and they asked me about a meteor uh, that was discovered in December um, 2018. And uh, I looked online and found a catalog that NASA uh, posted uh, of all 273 meteors that the US government measured. And I went to my student at the time, Amir Siraj, and said, check the fastest meteors in this catalog and see if they are unbound to the sun. And we checked and found one that was definitely unbound. In fact, it was moving faster than 95% of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun. So it was unusual, an outlier in speed, even relative to the local population of stars. And so we wrote a paper about it, submitted it to publication, and it was declined. The argument was, we don't believe the US government. <laughs> now, I was frustrated. I was chair of the board on physics and astronomy of the National Academies at the time, and I expressed my frustration at dinner. And uh, a colleague from Los Alamos said, I can help. And one thing led to another. The White House coordinated a letter that was sent by the US Space Command to NASA. 
in which the US Space Command that gets $40 billion a year um, stated at the 99.99% confidence that indeed this was an interstellar meteor. And at that point, I decided to lead an expedition that I'll describe in a few minutes. So this was actually the first uh, interstellar object that we know about. Uh, it also exploded low in the atmosphere. So it was actually able to sustain an external stress from friction with air that is higher than all 272 other meteors in the NASA catalog. And that raised, at least in my mind, the possibility that it's a Voyager-like meteor. Imagine our own Voyager leaving the solar system. That would take uh, about uh, 10,000 years. And eventually colliding with an exoplanet, a planet outside the solar system like Earth, it would appear as a meteor of unusual material strength and unusual speed. And finally, there was a third object discovered in August 2019. That one looked just like a familiar comet. So people said to me, doesn't it convince you that all the others are natural in origin? And I say, well, if you go down the street and you, say, you see a weird person, and after that you see a normal person, it doesn't make the weird person normal. So out of three, the first two appeared unlike familiar rocks. And that's exciting, don't you think? We have to check if any of them looks like a Tesla Roadster. <laughs> now, what is an interstellar object? It's very simple to explain. If you imagine the sun here in red and an object at some distance from it, moving at some speed. You know, for example, this object could be the Earth. We are moving around the sun at about 30 kilometers per second. Okay, that's a thousand times faster than the speed limit in the highway. And if you just increase our speed by a factor of a square root of two, by 40%, 42%, the Earth would escape from the solar system. That's all. Um, so anything moving fast enough, for, faster than 42 kilometers per second, at the Earth-Sun distance, for example, is interstellar, because it's moving too fast to be bound by gravity to the Sun. Um, a few months ago, there was a first reading of a play called A Piece of Sky. The playwright, is Josh Ravetch from Los Angeles, and he was inspired by the story of Oumuamua, my research on it, and decided to write a play. And I just want to mention one statement from that play. His hope is that it will go off-Broadway in the coming year. And the one sentence that touched me is the following. Why is childlike bullying more prevalent than childlike curiosity. And, you know, this is true on social media, but it is very much true in academia. You know, I've been for 30 years at Harvard University. I know academia from the inside out. And the strongest force in academia is not electromagnetism, it's not gravity, it's not the strong force, it's jealousy. So, two and a half years ago, I um, established the Galileo Project at Harvard University, and I'll speak a little more about what it does. And it was established a year, uh, about uh, a month, sorry, after 
the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, delivered a report to the US Congress in which she said, there are unidentified anomalous phenomena, objects in the sky, we don't know what they are. And gladly, about five months later, I was with her in the Washington National Cathedral, along with uh, Jeff Bezos and, and Bill uh, Nelson, the head of NASA, so I approached Avril and I said, Avril, you have a bachelor's degree in physics from the University of Chicago. So she speaks my language. I said, what do you make of these objects? And she said, I don't know. And I believe her. So I want to help her. And the Galileo project is trying to collect data on the sky. And so these are the three reports that Avril delivered since then, since June 2021, every year. The US Congress established the All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, ERO, which delivered the last report. They say they identify 97% of the objects. Great. What about the 3%? <laughs> Even one in a million that we cannot associate with human-made technologies would be big news for a scientist, perhaps not for the government which is interested in national security. Okay, so what we do as scientists is complementary. Anything made by Russia or China is boring as far as I'm concerned. So, Right now, there is uh, an observatory. And by the way, I used to be a theorist. And as of now, I'm leading this uh, Galileo project, which is an experimental project. Because nobody else will do it. I will not wait for others to do it. I think it should be done. It's common sense. But common sense is not common. Um, so these are the instruments. So let me show you a short video that will introduce the system. Welcome to an overview of the Galileo Project's development site, codenamed Pigeon Run. Our instrumentation suite consists of both wide field and narrow field sensors. Wide field sensors are used for target selection and tracking, while narrow field sensors gather higher resolution data on potentially anomalous objects. Our main instrument is DALEC, a hemispherical array of eight infrared cameras. Next to it is the ALCOR, a secondary high-resolution optical all-sky camera. Together, these instruments continuously monitor and track objects in the sky, analyzing them in real time for potential anomalous activity. This is AMOS, our acoustic monitoring omnidirectional system designed to detect and record acoustic signatures across the infrasonic, audible, and ultrasonic bands. AMOS also houses an ADSB antenna for logging aircraft transponder data, allowing us to quickly separate known from unknown objects. Here we have Skywatch, a multi-static passive radar system designed to detect and track multiple objects simultaneously, measuring object positions and kinematics. And Pac-Man is an environmental monitoring system for measuring local weather conditions. Sensors include an anemometer, temperature and pressure sensors, a particle counter, and a flux gate magnetometer. Next up is Spectre, a radio spectrum analyzer with a wide band antenna for measuring radio and microwave emissions. Beacon is currently our only narrow field instrument. Beacon is a high resolution pan tilt zoom camera capable of 40 times optical zoom. Our instruments collect a wide range of data, all of which is fed to our computing enclosure housed beneath the Dalek and Alcor instruments. Here, data is processed and analyzed in real time. Objects detected and tracked by the wide field instruments are localized in 3D space and analyzed for unusual characteristics. Selected targets are then sent to the Beacon PTZ for follow-up observation. Finally, data is recorded to disk and uploaded to the cloud via Starlink. These combined systems comprise the current version of the observatory class system, with many refinements, additions, and upgrades scheduled for near-term implementation at Pigeon Run.
Okay, so um, I will move uh, quickly through the details. Uh, we are also using satellite data, uh, looking at objects from above. Uh, the director of national intelligence before Avril was uh, Radcliffe, and he noted that they have some unusual images from satellites. And altogether, we have papers that we published on this system that is collecting data as we speak right now, and we have looked at over 100,000 objects in the sky over the past few months. So far, we just saw birds and airplanes. Stay tuned. <laughs> uh, but I would, what I would like to describe in terms of data is actually related to the expedition to retrieve materials from the Pacific Ocean site of the first reported interstellar meteor. And this is the letter on your left uh, that was sent by the US Space Command under the Department of Defense to NASA confirming the interstellar origin. But even after this letter was sent a year later, some astronomers published a paper saying they don't believe the US government, they must have gotten it wrong because they cannot fit the data with a model for stones. And I say, well, that's the stone age of science. Everything in the sky should be stones. We know most of the matter, 83% of the matter in the universe is a substance that we don't recognize. We call it dark matter. So we already know there is a lot of stuff out there which is not stones. So this uh, meteor had uh, three flares, three explosions, probably broke into three pieces. They were separated by a tenth of a second. The US government released this uh, light curve. And we concluded based on the altitude that was relatively low, about 20 kilometers, that this, the material strength of this object was tougher than even iron meteorites, which make up 5% of all meteorites. And we localized the site using seismometer data. Uh, altogether, the Department of Defense provided with an error box of about seven miles on a side. So let me show you some uh, photos from the expedition, which was about half a year ago. Uh, we rented a ship called Silver Star, very fittingly. And this project um, cost a um, million and a half. My sister, thinking I am where you are. Drifting in my sister, thinking I am where you are. Drifting in my sister, thinking I am one and where you are. Drifting in my sister, thinking I am one and where you are. So this is the team about 28 people on the deck of the ship. It was beautiful out there. And we had the best engineers, and navigators, and scientists. But there were big challenges. The ocean depth was a mile. The region was seven miles long. And we were looking for tiny droplets that were melted off the surface of this meteor when it was exposed to the immense heat from the fireball that it generated, which released a few percent of the Hiroshima atomic bomb energy, and the object was bigger than 500 kilograms. These are some photos. We used the magnetic sled, as you can see in the top middle and the, top, and the right side. 
uh, basically a sled that uh, we placed on the ocean floor that had magnets on both sides and collected particles, magnetic par magnetized particles um, that we were hoping, some of which would be those droplets, those spherules from the meteor. Uh, and we would bring it on the deck. I mean, the cable that connected the sled to the ship was about um, uh, four miles long. Um, and uh, we brought uh, the, the sled to the deck and then would scrape it, scrape the magnets for the materials that we collected. What you see on the bottom left and uh, middle panels are the filming crew. There were about 50 filmmakers and producers that wanted to be on the ship, uh, but I had a contract just with one, and hopefully there will be a Netflix uh, documentary coming out in 2025. Um, and uh, I was jogging every morning, as I do on land, at sunrise, and one morning they showed up, and they, with the cameras, and they said, um, we want to film you jogging. And they asked me to jog three times my usual. Uh, and that was like uh, about uh, nine miles um, that morning. And, uh, and uh, at the end, the director asked me, Avi, it looks like you're running. Are you running away from something or towards something? <laughs> and I said, both. I'm running away from some of my colleagues who have strong opinions without seeking evidence. And I'm running towards a higher intelligence in interstellar space. And so here you see the magnets. Uh, and we use the vacuum cleaner to collect all the materials, not to miss anything, because this expedition cost a, a million and a half. We had to make sure that we make the best use of, of everything. Uh, and then we dried up the material and put it under a microscope to look at those particles. Most of them, most of the magnetic particles were volcanic ash. Not interesting, from this earth. So let me show you the sled in action. So it bas it's basically like mowing the lawn. <laughs> uh, it would go over the bottom of the, the ocean, uh, about uh, a mile deep, and uh, collect materials. Now, most of the stuff is muck, not magnetic. And uh, the first challenge was actually to keep it on the ocean floor, because the cable would lift it up. It would kite. And so it took a day before we managed, the engineers on the ship were able to figure out a method of keeping the sled on the ground. And here is a rock <laughs> that uh, went for the ride. <laughs> and we surveyed um, through 26 runs back and forth, a region that was roughly um, 10 miles long and uh, collected, and actually on the ship, after six days we were not finding anything, then we realized we need to filter the particles, just collect the bigger ones, and we gotten, we've gotten rid of the volcanic ash, and then we started finding those ferals, and we found 50 of them on the ship. And they looked very distinct from the background sand. You see here, they look uh, sort of like uh, metallic spheres. We used uh, tweezers to separate them. And here are some pictures. I, I wrote uh, uh, 54 diary reports during that expedition uh, on medium.com. We had very good internet connectivity. And uh, these uh, diary reports were read by millions around the world. They were translated to Spanish. And I used it as an opportunity to communicate how science is done. Collecting evidence, that's the key. And um, my daughter, who is sitting right here, <laughs> looked at these photos. She said, um, Dad, could you thread one of them, put them on a necklace for me to wear? And I said, <laughs> <laughs> they're actually smaller than a millimeter and they're made of iron mostly, so there is no way to thread them. 
although they do look beautiful. And so we put them in vials, just like babies in a delivery room. <laughs> and then ship them. I shipped them uh, by FedEx uh, to my home address, because I was worried that customs may not uh, <laughs> allow them to pass through. Or, but at any event, uh, it took a few days for FedEx to deliver. And, uh, I said to myself, what, what are a few days compared to the billions of years that it took the material to arrive to the solar system? You know, that's not much of a delay. Um, you can see us here on the left uh, uh, on a rainy night. And so um, I brought the materials to the laboratory of my colleague at Harvard, who is a world-renowned geochemist named uh, Stein Jacobson. You see him on my right. Uh, on my left, but your right. And then on the other side is a summer intern, Sophie Bergstrom, who came to shadow me over the summer because she wanted to become a science writer. So she wanted to see how science is, is done. And at some point she said, well, could I help? And I said, of course. And I gave her tweezers and uh, a microscope. And within a couple of weeks, she found 600 spherules in the materials. So she increased our sample by a factor of 10. And I gave her the honorary title, the Spheral Hunter. <laughs> and many of the spherules were concentrated near the meteor path. Um, here are some uh, electron uh, microscope imaging. Uh, uh, we found the uh, spheres inside spheres, just like Russian dolls. <laughs> and the idea is that uh, when small spheres condense, they might be engulfed by molten iron that glues them together. And here are some images of spherules that probably came from some other meteors. So out of the 850 spherules that we have at our disposal, um, most of them, 78%, are materials that we recognize as solar system materials. And we catalog them. They are known in the literature. But 22% are different. We call them differentiated spherules. So these are the ones that are familiar, S-type, G-type, I-type, these are types that you can find in the literature. But we found a class of spherules never seen before. We gave it a name, differentiated. 22% of the sample near the meteor path. And then they had subclasses. And you can see the one on the bottom right is an example, a good example. That was the biggest, 1.3 millimeters in size of order a milligram. And it looks as a, a, a merger of three spheres that didn't have time to actually become round because it solidified too early. And then we checked using a mass spectrometer the composition. For example, of this ferrule that I just showed you. And this is, these are 60 elements from the periodic table, starting from lithium on the left, going all the way to uranium on the right. And we normalize the abundances relative to the standard solar composition. For example, the meteor that fell over Berlin a, a couple of weeks ago represents the building blocks of the rocky planets in the solar system. So this, the solar material, the material that made the solar system, had a certain uh, composition, uh, abundances of various elements. And that's represented as one here. And what we find, for example, in this particular spheroid is that beryllium, lanthanum, uranium, and many other elements are enhanced by up to a factor of 1,000 relative to the standard solar composition. And so we call this Belau spherules. 
for beryllium, lanthanum, uranium. And we found uh, somewhere between 2 to 12 percent of our spherules have this unusual composition never reported before in the scientific literature, never seen in solar system materials, not seen on the crust of Earth, the moon, Mars, asteroids, something new. And we think it's from outside the solar system, this composition. So completely independently of the high speed of the object. You might ask, why is uranium so enhanced? Well, it could be a natural process that did it. It could also be fuel. And a few months ago, there were some scientists, as I said, that there, are, that, that there are some scientists who just have a problem with any flower that rises above the grass level. <laughs> and so they argued three independent publication, uh, publications. One was a paper saying what they found is actually coal ash. Based on three elements, they said the beryllium, the lanthanum, and the uranium are similar to coal ash. And then two other scientists posted on the archive, it's coal ash, and talked to reporters. And everyone said, oh, yeah, they just found things from uh, human activities. And, and then there was a blog post uh, that got hundreds of thousands of readers. And the person said, it's all coal ash. And, that's it. OK, so we checked, and it's not coal ash. Uh, these are 55 elements, and we are comparing the ratio of element abundances for coal ash relative divided by the below uh, abundances. And you see that it's very different. That's the, in red, uh, coal ash. And it's very different than the green, which is the below. So it's not coal ash. And yet, an editor in a prestigious journal two weeks ago was telling me that we should not make the case that the material is extrasolar, even though there is no report in the scientific literature about material with this composition. Now, we actually wrote a paper with a postdoc of mine uh, a few months ago saying, oh, there could be a natural process that results in the Belau composition. If you just take a planet like the Earth and bring it close to the most common star, which is a dwarf star, it would get spaghettified, stretched by gravity, by the tidal force, into a thin filament of rocks, some of which will be ejected to space at the speed of this meteor. So what happens when you melt the rock on the surface of a planet is that you get differentiation. And the elements that we find abundant are the ones that are left in the crust of the planet. So we have a scenario that explains it. But guess what? When we send this idea for publication, uh, it was rejected. And so we said, OK, well, the editor didn't want to consider it. And uh, said, it's I, it didn't give us a chance to respond to the first referee report. And so we sent it to the most prestigious journal in Europe in astrophysics. And it was accept I mean, the, the referee on the first look at it ac recommended it for publication. So I will not get into the details, but we actually did a simulation that shows that a planet like the Earth, when it comes close to the most common type of star, dwarf star that has maybe 10% of the mass of the sun, most stars are like that, uh, will actually produce interstellar objects like this meteor. So let me uh, summarize this expedition. It was very risky for a variety of reasons. The, there were many failure points. For example, um, we might have not secured the needed funds. It cost one and a half million dollars. And gladly, the funder, Charles Hoskinson, arranged a Zoom call with me and said, you have the money. 
Uh, we, I, you know, we, we might have had a hard time recruiting qualified engineers and navigators. The machinery that we built with the magnets might have not worked. It might have not been on the ocean floor for, the, for long enough. And uh, we might have not found enough spherules from this uh, meteor just because maybe it was not big enough and we just wouldn't search the entire area. And in addition, my colleague here, Stein Jacobson, might have said, you know, I have a busy research program. I don't have time now to work on your spherules. But gladly he did. And so, Taking risks in science is worthwhile because sometimes the stars align. And what you see here is a picture that we took uh, at the end of the expedition. And next to me is Art Wright, who was the party chief, the navigator. Uh, he was a commander of a destroyer during the Vietnam War. He's 85 years old, with a lot of experience. Everything he led was a success, including this expedition. And here we were looking at the sunset, discussing the next expedition that we hope to do this year, to look for bigger pieces of this meteor, so we can tell what it was, a rock or something else. And so, as a result of this experience, I developed a number of guiding principles, and I'll close with that. First of all, in science, you have to follow the evidence, not your opinions. It's very easy to have an opinion. And you need to use instruments, because that is known even for the World Soccer Organization, FIFA. As you are aware of, there was a Women's Soccer Cup in summer 2023. And they didn't go out to ask the audience or to ask the players whether there was a goal. They would use cameras, instruments, to figure it out. So that's the way science is done. And then uh, uh, another principle that is advocated by basketball coaches is keep your eyes on the ball, not on the audience. And the, the one thing I found is that there are many people who claim they are protecting science. Um, some of them did not publish a scientific paper for two decades. So how dare they? I mean, it's just like spectators watching a soccer match and telling the players how to pass a ball. They're not practicing science. And it's really important not to wrestle. <laughs> with mud wrestlers because you get dirty. <laughs> um, and there is this uh, metaphor that I like a lot um, about the eagle that um, very often has crows pecking at its neck. And you might think that the eagle would fight the crows. But no, the eagle rises to great heights where the oxygen level is low enough for the crows to drop off the back of the eagle. And that I find as the best metaphor for doing science. Just do the science to the best of your ability and the crows will drop off. And finally, life is sometimes a self-fulfilling prophecy, so it's better to be an optimist. Thank you. It's okay. We can ask questions. No, no, no. We have uh, maybe two or, two or three questions because we have to be out of the hall okay. for another class. Oh. <laughs> Anybody want a question? Anybody have a question? Yeah, there are over there. And... Yeah. Uh, how would you design a... No, no, wait, wait, wait. Can you wait? Is that okay? This is one. How would you design an expedition to Luna to find... Space junk. To, the, to where? The, what did you say? To where? To, to Luna, to the moon. The moon. Yeah. Um, so the moon is interesting because it's actually a museum. We, we don't recognize that. But the reason it's a museum is because it doesn't, doesn't have an atmosphere. So, you know, 
rocks that, or any object that falls on the moon does not burn up because there is no atmosphere, and the moon collects all the objects that impacted it over the past 4.6 billion years, okay? So um, we haven't done a search, but there could be a lot of interesting objects there. There could be artifacts, not just rocks that impacted the moon. And we need to, to, to search for that. And one way to do that is by having a, a swarm of small satellites with cameras that basically hover over the entire moon and just check all the craters that are there and see if any of them looks unusual. And the same is true about uh, Mars. It has a thin atmosphere as of now, so we, can, we should check those objects. For Mars, I'm most interested in visiting the caves. There are these lava tubes. And uh, you may enter into them with a drone. Uh, what I'm interested in is whether there are any relics of early life on Mars over there, or maybe some prehistoric paintings on the walls of these lava tubes. <laughs> because for that, you just need intelligent life to start on, on, on Mars twice as fast as it did on, on, on Earth. And a factor of two is not so, so, such a big factor. I mean, Mars had an atmosphere in liquid water, oceans, lakes, uh, just two billion years ago, at the middle of its life. OK, more? I was wondering if, on one of your expeditions, if there would be a way to look for debris from the meteorite below the surface. Like, that magnet was just scraping the surface, but, like, is there a way to detect if there are larger pieces of the meteor, maybe, like, meters below the ocean floor? Because yeah. sediment kind of stacks. Yeah, so, first of all, uh, it was only a decade ago, so there is not much sedimentation. But you're right that something big enough may have sunk. Um, and so we are planning to have a video feed that will allow us to look, uh, not just collect. And um, it will be a more expensive expedition. It will probably be somewhere between four and six uh, million. Anyone interested in funding it and being on our <laughs> ship? Uh, just let me know. We have a question over there. Okay. Who? Ah, yes, go ahead. It's not on, but maybe you should shout. Okay, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask for uh, your expeditions as a theoretical person. I mean, you work in theoretical physics. How is it to be now working, of course, with experiments and on the field, I mean, like doing the practical stuff, but still like being a leader and following your beliefs on theoretical stuff. Yeah, I should say that for me it was a choice of last resort because nobody else would do it. Um, but it's very fulfilling because as a theorist, you know, you work in the world of ideas. That's what, you know, whenever someone tells me something, within seconds I have an idea. And uh, when I started astrophysics, my mentor at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, John Bacall, came to me and said, uh, you know, which computer languages are you mastering? And I said, I, I don't use much the computer. You know, if I need to solve a problem, I, I use it for that particular problem. But I, I was not interested. And he said, that's amazing that you were able to have a PhD without uh, much computer knowledge. And uh, I had by now a career of 30 years at Harvard. And the only reason is I have ideas. It just, they just bubble up. You know, I don't, it's not an, I don't invest any effort. But the downside of that is that even if you are right, the ideas get credit only when the experimentalists find what you talked about. And even then, they often forget about you. And even in the case where theorists are working on it for decades, they very often cite it in the first decade, recognize that you had the idea, but after they write enough papers, they continue to cite themselves and then you are forgotten. So there is a frustration that comes up with just having ideas. Um, on the other hand, if you find something, you know, if, suppose we find a gadget. I asked my students at Harvard, I said, suppose we find a gadget and it has buttons on it, should we press a button? Uh, and just think about it, if we find a gadget from another civilization, 
you know, it's, it's not, I mean, people who work on string theory, you know, theoretical physicists, they get their satisfaction from demonstrating that they are smart by doing intellectual gymnastics, okay? But who said, I mean, nature is under no obligation to follow complicated mathematics. I mean, it's a good arena for you to show that you are smart, that you are capable of playing with math mathematics, and in the, you know, in the branch of theoretical physics, you will be regarded highly. But is that really what you want, or do you want to understand nature? And if you find a gadget, it doesn't require fancy math, necessarily, but it would have a huge impact on humanity, on society. So then you have a choice, either doing something in the real world or in fantasy world, which is pretty much what string theorists are doing right now, because there is no chance, at least in the immediate future, for their ideas to be demonstrated. And so I think, you know. No, no, there is no string theorist in the audience. <laughs> yes, because I, I, I would know otherwise. Um, but my point is that, um, you know, that nature is under no obligation to uh, be mathematically sophisticated, okay? And therefore, doing experimental work is very rewarding because you can find something really important. Uh, it's not about you, you know. It's not about demonstrating that you're smart. It's more about learning what nature is. It's sort of like going on a date and listening to the other person rather than showing off. Okay. <laughs> Thank yes. you. So most scientists, uh, or many scientists. Wait, 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 sorry. The, the following story. You have a degree. Oh, okay. You and then, uh, go ahead. Thank you so much for both the wonderful talk and also thank you so much for opening doors to a new field of exploration, which many of your colleagues, I, su I suspect, don't appreciate, but, you know, gr great for you. Uh, two questions. Did you do an, e an equally extensive search of a region very far from where the, uh, f from where the, uh, the putative arrival point of the, of the fragments of the meteor? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Sec and secondly, yeah. you know, uh, when I see uranium and lanthanum and beryllium, I think of nuclear weapons and wonder whether is it possible that the uh, you know, the, the old Pacific nuclear weapons tests could have produced ferals that look like this. Did you test the uranium for 235 as well as 238? Right, so for, uh, for the first um, uh, question, we actually um, went away by about um, 30 kilometers, uh, but that may not be enough. And next time we will definitely go much farther away because in the case of the Berlin mete meteor that I mentioned, um, the debris spread across a 10 kilometer region and it was sideways actually. And uh, the meteor that I was mentioning moved at um, 40 kilometers per second and the flares, there were three flares separated by a tenth of a second. So the entire span was about 10 kilometers, just the motion of the meteor. And then sideways, it could be another. So one would like to go really far, like 100 kilometers. We will do it next time. With respect to nuclear weapons, yes, we checked, and it's not. But we didn't check yet isotopes. That, is, that requires more uh, material. So if we find p big pieces of the object, that, allow, that would allow us to do a very detailed uh, isotope study. And uh, I very, Now, the thing about uranium is more, most important is not so much nuclear weapons, but it's a clock. Uh, 238 decays into um, um, uh, lead, and uh, you can time, I mean, the half-life is uh, roughly the, the age of the solar system. So if we find an age that is very different from the solar system, that will demonstrate beyond any reasonable doubt. And moreover, I was thinking about it at the ship, that um, if you know how long, you know, how old the object is, and you know the velocity that it was moving at, multiply the velocity times the age, and you get the distance so you can figure out where it came from. So, this is really interesting. I, I wonder if they'll let any women on the next voyage. Okay, <laughs> so on that I should say, I, I would say that uh, my wife was worried that um, the, having a mixed crew could introduce instability because the quarters were really small. 
That was the issue. So we could have broken the symmetry just having women, only women, if, if that's what you, I mean, that, that would be great. Well, we don't need to go into the sexual fears. <laughs> but um, I think that was a great talk, and I, I, we, unfortunately we have to stop now. But the good news is, A, cheese cubes. Two, Avi's going to be signing books, and you can ask a question as, you, as, as uh, your question. I'm sure there's many more questions as you get him to sign the book. So please join us upstairs. Thank you. Hi. Patrick, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, my, I went to Stanford undergrad. Uh -huh. My reunion next year is next year. And talking to the development office, we're doing a 